video number seven, we reviewed the architecture of light. I argued that light does not consist of a stream of particles or of transverse waves as orthodoxy claims. Light has the physical configuration of a DNA-like rope. This rope permanently unites any two atoms of the universe. Light consists of a torsion running along the rope. The question now is, how does the atom fit into this scheme of things? How do we justify its architecture under the rope hypothesis? In 1911, Ernst Rutherford shoots alpha particles at a sheet of gold and is surprised to find that some bounce off the foil. Rutherford's results led him to develop the planetary model of the atom, where a tiny negative bead known as an electron orbits a bowling ball known as a proton. The debate of the day centered around why the electron doesn't lose energy and spiral into the nucleus. Niels Bohr answered that the electron jumps back and forth between orbits. He offered no reasons for this strange behavior. Louis de Broglie proposed instead that the electron does not spiral into the nucleus because it is stretched around its alleged orbit in an integral number of waves. Now a wave stretched around the perimeter of an atom and a bead that orbits the nucleus are two radically different physical interpretations for how an atom works. The mathematicians never resolved the paradox. Schrodinger and Born developed the notion that the atom was more like a cloud that envelopes the proton. However, the quantum mathematicians clarified that this cloud is nothing like a cloud you see in the sky on a sunny day, or after the bomb falls. This mathematical cloud is just a cloud of probability, the probability of finding the electron bead somewhere around the nucleus. The cloud model of the atom that quantum cells today is grossly misleading. The cloud model is no different conceptually than the planetary model. But rather than roll around a plane like a Saturnian ring, as de Broglie proposed, the mathematicians concocted the story that the electron bead orbits around a shell that encapsulates the proton. The cloud model is a movie of one electron at different locations around the nucleus. The mathematicians call this movie the cloud model of the atom. If Adam Mann were to take snapshots of the cloud model of the quantum hydrogen atom, each photograph should still reveal a proton bowling ball in the center with an electron bead next to it. Here are two close-up pictures of atoms. In the first one we are told that we are looking at silicon atoms. In the second one we are staring at cesium and iodine on a copper background. The quantum mathematicians want you to believe that the smooth globular objects you see in these still images are movies of electron beads. You are allegedly staring at traces made by particles. The establishment claims that it has experimentally verified the quantum version in the lab. The Brookhaven National Accelerator alleges that this picture shows the debris from a collision of two gold ions. It is quite easy to show that this is not true. The mathematicians tell you that they cannot detect anything smaller than a quark because they don't have enough energy to peer beyond this level. There are allegedly three quarks per proton and per neutron. A gold atom has 79 protons, 79 electrons, and about 120 neutrons. If what you are staring at is the total number of particles that we can detect from such a collision, we should see no more than 1400 particles. In this cross-section alone, without factoring the three-dimensional radial components, we see thousands upon thousands of particles. The claim becomes even more dubious when the researchers urge you to believe that each of the lines you are seeing is a movie of a particle leaving the scene. So if the quantum particle model is false, what does an atom really look like? Let's first illustrate the atom. Then let's justify its architecture under the rope hypothesis and see how its physical configuration relates to its behavior. Consistent with the schrodinger born cloud, the electron is a balloon that encapsulates the atom. Up close, the electron looks like a ball of yarn. The proton is a tiny dandelion with its quills stretching out like a sea urchin. The electron and the proton merge to give us the hydrogen atom, the most common element in the universe. Recall that under the rope hypothesis, the electromagnetic ropes from every atom in the universe converge upon our tiny atom. The incoming electric and magnetic threads of a given rope 
fork out at the perimeter of the atom. Consistent with the Broglie's hypothesis, the magnetic threads curl around and form a wavy surface. The electric thread continues straight towards the center of the atom. This architecture explains why the electron does not spiral into the nucleus. It also justifies quantum jump. Consistent with Bohr's theory, when the electron expands, it can do so only at the expense of the electromagnetic rope, which it instantly torques. Conversely, when the electron balloon contracts, it releases a link of electromagnetic rope while also sending a signal. We call the aggregate of links released and absorbed energy. The physical interpretation of C squared in Einstein's famous equation is that an atom sends electromagnetic signals to every atom and every atom sends signals to it via electromagnetic ropes. We refer to the aggregate of friction generated at each point around the electron balloon as charge. So now, let's compare the thread version of the atom against the irrational and inconsistent versions proposed by quantum. On the one hand, the mathematicians would have you believe that an atom is comprised of discrete beads that orbit the nucleus. On the other, they treat the orbits of the electron beads as balloons. The mathematicians need the bead model of the electron to explain ionization and electric current. They need the balloon model to explain how two atoms physically bind to form a molecule. The mathematicians have in effect blended the orbiting bead and the cloud into a single model in order to cover all the bases. They have thus rendered quantum theory unfalsifiable. To make their model even less credible, the mathematicians have the negative electron bead going through the center of the positive nucleus and out the other end in figure 8p orbitals. Those mathematicians who realize the implications try to con you by stopping the electron at the doorsteps of the proton, but neither group can justify either behavior. Therefore, the merged particle and balloon models proposed by quantum guarantees that you will never have a chance to win an argument against a quantum mathematician. On the other hand, the balloon version of the electron enables us to treat the atom in the same way it is treated daily by chemists. We are looking at what is plainly there, a skin. The skin of an atom is a surface weaved by gazillions of threads. This model enables us to visualize how two atoms bind with each other and form a molecule. The orbitals that the chemists illustrate in no way can be confused with orbits of electron beads. The picture of two colliding gold atoms presented by the Brookhaven accelerator shows that atoms are the convergence of threads from every atom in the universe. It does not show that we are staring at traces of particles. Likewise, the illustrations and descriptions of hybridized atomic orbitals, as well as pictures of smooth-skinned atoms, can never be confused for particle orbitals. The particle model of quantum has no scientific basis whatsoever and is in direct violation of what is plainly in front of us. The claim of particle physicists that they accelerate particles is fundamentally flawed. The mathematicians will never relinquish their beloved particles because this is their bread and butter. But a mathematical description of what happens at each point in space has nothing to do with the architecture of the atom, the proton, and the electron. The images of collisions and of individual atoms summarily debunk the particle version offered by quantum and instead support the thread model of the atom.